ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Joanne Condori, and I'm a member of the Green Sanctuary Committee here at Tapestry Unitarian Universalist Congregation. As moderator, I will be introducing our panelists for today's discussion and taking questions during the Q&A session. Several questions have already been provided and will be included as part of today's presentation. Uh, as time allows, we will take additional questions, hopefully in the last 15 minutes or so. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank Carol Semmelroth for organizing today's presentation and to our AV team for supporting us and being able to provide this panel discussion in person as well as over Zoom. Uh, we are scheduled to end today's discussion promptly at 1.15, so let's get started. Uh, it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce to you our panel for today's discussion of Dr. Keeling's curve. Mike Farrell, best known for his eight years on MASH and five on Providence. Actor Mike Farrell is also a writer, director, and producer. Dominic and Eugene and Patch Adams. Recently appearing in the assassination of Gianni Versace for FX and One Song, an independent film, he also performs Dr. Keeling's Curve, a one-man show. A social justice activist for four decades, he served on human rights and peace delegations to a number of countries, including Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, USSR, Paraguay, Chile, Israel, the occupied territories, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Czechoslovakia, Somalia, Kenya, Croatia, Bosnia, Cuba, Rwanda, Zaire, Tanzania, Mexico, Costa Rica, and this year to Samoa. As co-chair of the Southern California Committee on Human Rights Watch from, uh, from 1994 to 2004 and president of Death Penalty Focus for 25 years, he has seen too many death rows and speaks, debates, writes, and coordinates efforts to stop executions across this country. Given its dwindling use, he believes the end of state killing is within reach in the US and is active internationally in support of worldwide abolition. Mike is the author of two books, Just Call Me Mike, A Journey to Actor and Activist, and Of Mule and Man. Secondly, we have Robert Hall, a physicist by training and a graduate of Stanford University. Robert retired from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory last July after a 34-year career as an interplanetary navigation engineer. While at JPL, he was a co-lead of Labs Green Club. He's now a consultant advising on building performance, building electrification, and sustainability. In 2011, Robert founded the Pasadena Foothills chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby, an organization devoted to building the political will for a livable planet. He has spoken widely to elected representatives and public audiences in the San Gabriel Valley about both the urgency of addressing global warming and to practical, affordable, and bipartisan solutions to the climate crisis. In 2015, Robert founded Pasadena 100, a citizen's advocacy group promoting 100% clean energy in Pasadena by 2035. And finally, George Shaw. George Shaw is a playwright and children's author whose plays have been presented in New York and at the Wilmingstown Theater Festival. George's one man, Chester, 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 about the life of Chester Carlson inventor of the Xerox machine, has been presented in various venues all over the US. George enjoys writing about scientists and inventors, and his first flight, the story of Tom Tate and the Wright brothers, has been in print for more than two decades. In 2011, he was arrested with Bill McGibbon and hundreds of other activists outside the Obama White House protesting the Keystone Pipeline. And now, I'd like to turn it over to George Shaw to start off our presentation today. Thank you, George. Um, I presume almost everybody here has uh, seen Dr. Keeling's curve. And the question was asked, um, OK, Dr. Keeling's curve was shot at Caltech in 2014. 
and it is now 2022. How have things changed? Have they changed for the better, the worse, and so on? Um, anybody want to take that one on? Rob? Okay, well, I'll give it a shot. Um, in one way, things have uh, changed for, yeah, in, in a number of ways, things have changed for the worse. Uh, you know, there's still way too many CO2 emissions. Uh, no serious effort has been made to, to lower emissions. Uh, Joe Biden gave it a shot. Uh, he did come up with a climate plan that uh, really would have worked and would have enabled us to cut CO2 emissions in half um, by 20, uh, 2030. But of course, Joe Manchin uh, got in the way of that and it didn't happen. Uh, so I imagine uh, the president will try some other approaches. Is everybody picking me up, hearing me? Oh, okay, good, good, that, that's progress. Uh, in another way, um, one thing has changed dramatically. When we uh, shot Dr. Kaling's curve, there was a lot of debate, phony debate created by the fossil fuels industry uh, about whether climate change was for real. And a lot of that's gone away. Uh, right now, uh, the latest Yale climate poll, uh, about two thirds of the American public believe that climate change is for real and that it's a serious problem. So that, that's a big difference. Um, the Glasgow conference, um, I don't know, is depicted in the media as kind of a dismal affair, but I don't know. It, it's it's a, uh, the delegates are certainly a lot more honest, shall we say, or forthcoming than they were in Paris. Uh, we know what we're dealing with right now. Everything changed when in October of 2018, the IPCC announced that we absolutely had to cut emissions 50% by 2030 and 100% by 2050 if we expected to have a livable planet or if we expected to avoid eventually going up to two degrees, three degrees and so on. And three degrees is impossible. It's gonna be a total nightmare. We'll be creating as much as a billion refugees and you know, it's gonna to be totally chaotic. So. Um, we have a shot even now of avoiding 1.5 degrees, which is not too bad, but two degrees is not good at all. So there we go. Now, I'm going to try to get through as many of our questions as we can, because, you know, we are starting late, but uh, we'll do the best we can. Um, question, um, okay. Uh, Rob Hoa. Rob has a presentation to do on Arctic uh, permafrost, which is a very dangerous situation. And uh, Rob, do you, do you want to start? Okay, so can um, can everybody see that now? Is it sh is it sharing? Mm -hmm. You can. Okay, great. Let me see if I can make that full screen. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, well, let's let's get on. It's, <laughs> we'll uh, move move forward here. So, here's the eight hundred thousand year version of Dr. Keeling's curve. Okay. Carbon dioxide levels have oscillated within just those narrow bounds down here for um, you know all the all that time until the um, pre-industrial. Uh, or you know during the pre-industrial times now carbon dioxide is up to here which is one and a half times higher than the, these uh, legacy levels so what's the risk in going out of scope like you see here what are the consequences of driving drunk in the dark So NASA's orbiting carbon observatory is a satellite measuring CO2 from above. We don't need it to tell us overall concentrations. Dr. Keeling took care of that. This satellite's value is in observing hotspots or sites of anomalously, 
sorry, anomalously high carbon dioxide emissions. Um, one of its jobs is to look for cheaters if we ever get some kind of an agreement. But like carbon dioxide, methane is a greenhouse gas, a very powerful one. So powerful, in fact, that NASA has given methane its own supervillain icon. Methane's global warming potential is 84 times greater than carbon dioxide. Imagine if you were 84 times wealthier than you are now. So in 2016, a JPL colleague built a compact methane detector. He took it for a drive around Pasadena, and this is what he discovered. Significant ongoing leakage from gas lines all around the city. And it's not only Pasadena, it's cities almost everywhere. Now these, these, these uh, colors, there's a color coding here, just to kind of give you an idea, um, the, red, the red circles, and really there's just, there's one really large red circle here in the middle. That's equivalent to driving um, a car, a, a com, you know, internal combustion car, a thousand miles a day, every day, just driving it around. Um, and the yellow, the yellow ones are one tenth that, so 100 miles every day. And the, and the green are, are sort of, or the orange are sort of halfway in between that. But this is happening everywhere. And you probably remember Aliso Canyon. A corroded pipe caused that blowout. That leak lasted four months. And it released as much methane as 20 million Pasadenas. A gas storage facility in Texas. Leaks like this are common at fracking facilities. This shows large quantities of methane escaping from a landfill site in Spain, imaged from, from orbit. Here's a leaking pipeline in Kazakhstan. A snapshot inventory of super emitters. Most cities don't show up at this scale. Remember, for its, well, for its 15 years in the atmosphere, methane is nearly 100 times. Remember, at, at 84 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. So all of this matters because we risk destabilizing Earth's natural systems, which in turn will lead to positive feedback loops, where one condition reinforces another over and over. It's also referred to as a vicious cycle. Feedback loops lead to tipping points, and there are lots of candidates spread around the world. To put this risk in perspective, think of dominoes, one after the other falling, after just one kicking off the other after it's one starts. One example, when northern latitudes warm, the permafrost there thaws. Those areas were once swamps, which froze in the ice ages. So when they melt now, their arrested decay resumes releasing methane. That leads to more warming and so on. Melt pools in Alaska where methane is bubbling out. If we don't act soon, at some point, all our efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions will be pointless because by then methane induced heating will dominate. The Amal Crater was discovered in a remote area of Siberia in 2014. At the time, no one had any idea where it came from because it certainly wasn't an impact crater. It turns out it was caused by an enormous belch of methane from the subsurface. More of these have occurred since then and they're all correlated with hot summers in the Arctic. Preliminary surveys of a similar crater in Alaska offer this explanation now for the Yamal crater. 
The Alaska crater was only discovered a couple of years ago because it's underwater. So up here, we have the Arctic tundra in this, in this sort of profile. And here, this is a meltwater lake. This is the lake that's, that's covering up this, this, this crater. This, uh, this region down here, the, the white area, this is the permafrost, the frozen ground that's uh, um, locking in the, you, you know, above, the, the resides above the, the lithosphere down here. And now this is what's been come to be known now as a methane chimney. Because down here, there's large, appear to be large quantities of methane. Uh, perhaps in, in geologic seeps. The permafrost has been acting as a cap, trapping it down there. As the weather warms and the cap thins, cracks form in the weaker parts of the permafrost, allowing methane to escape. Up through this one, there's one crater there. <laughs> so in coming years, we should expect more and more methane to be released in this way as the climate warms. And ditto for the Arctic Ocean seabed. Clathrate deposits there are rich in methane. Here, here's the seabed here. As the water warms, methane is released from the ocean floor. These are bubbles of methane that have been imaged with a, um, a sonogram back in 2019. Here's what clathrates look like. Similar to paraffin in texture, but less firm very combustible. These are methane levels starting 800,000 years ago, same, same scale as the, the CO2 I showed um, at the start. It's been stable, the levels have been stable, except for the last 150 years. We saw that carbon dioxide levels have increased one and a half times since then, but methane has jumped three times. And what's alarming is that its concentration has risen significantly in the past 15 years and appears to be caused by the growth in cattle feed lots and fracking operations. That additional methane contributes to more warming, which leads to more permafrost melt and more methane escaping from the Arctic. So this is a video of global warming temperatures over the last 140 years. Blue colors represent temperatures lower, less than the mean average temperature of the 1960s and yellows and reds are warmer than the 1960s average. So it's kind of a mottled appearance because we're not, the, the planet isn't warming up all in one uniform uh, series. There's all these different, and you can see over the land masses, the temperature is much higher. It's, um, than our average increase. So this is like around two degrees Celsius rise over the, the Asian, especially in the Northern latitudes. Um, but the average worldwide right now in, um, is around 1.1, 1.2 degrees Celsius for the entire planet increase since the pre-industrial era, which is equivalent to two degrees Fahrenheit. So we have it. We've seen that much rise in, in, since, since um, you know, the last 200, 250 years. But what, 0 0.9 degrees of that too, almost half, has been contributed by methane. So it's not only carbon dioxide that we have to be concerned with. There's a lot more water vapor in the atmosphere now too, because higher temperatures lead to higher evaporation rates. Water vapor is also a greenhouse gas. In fact, it's the most predominant one because there's so much of it. It too is another feedback loop, another positive feedback loop as more water vapor accumulates in the atmosphere. Here's an example of what increased atmospheric water vapor can do. I live in Pasadena. Uh, we've experienced our share of hot days. So uh, meteorologists define an extreme heat day as a high greater than or equal to 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, the usual number in a year in Pasadena has been six. 
Um, but look at what has happened over the past five years. Look at the number of these extreme heat days that have occurred. Um, and as well, there's a couple of all-time record highs. In 2018, there was a record high. And then two years later, there was a new all-time record high. What's disquieting is that the sophisticated climate models used now by climate modelers predict that the number of extreme heat days in the San Gabriel Valley will rise by 2050 to 20 days. 20 extreme heat days by the year 2050 is what the models are predicting. But <laughs> clearly, the numbers experienced in Pasadena for the past five years are already way beyond that. A hot day in Los Angeles in 2018. A record setting hot day in 2020, 121 degrees. Last June's heat wave, highs in the hundred teens in Seattle and Portland. However, the highest recorded temperature in that heat dome was way up in Canada at 122 degrees. This certainly isn't your father's weather. On the world's current warming trajectory, in another 60 to 70 years, heat wave highs in LA will reach 150 degrees. It'll be like living in a sauna. Under those conditions, construction workers won't be able to work outside during heat waves. Neither will farm workers or gardeners. The takeaway message from this graph, labor productivity decreases a lot at higher temperatures. Moreover, temperatures don't have to rise to 150 degrees or even 122 to harm you. In wetter places than here, merely a few hours exposure to a wet bulb temperature of 95 is almost always fatal. That's when relative humidity exceeds 90% and the thermometer reads 95 or higher. So the Gulf Coast, the East Coast, perhaps the Pacific Northwest. And then there's biodiversity loss. Oh. It's in our own best interests to preserve a healthy biosphere. For example, that's where the oxygen we breathe comes from. In protecting nature, we're protecting ourselves. Concern over climate change is not just about meteorology. It's all about protecting life, protecting us. So what can you do? Even just narrowly focused on limiting methane emissions. An easy step is to electrify your home. Eliminate all gas use. Even your meter leaks. Then, to keep electric bills affordable, because we all know that gas is cheaper than our than electricity, improve your home's envelope, its walls, its roof. Passive house principles can help with that. Passive houses use 90% less energy, and that's achievable by following five principles in building or in refurbishing your house. Super insulate your walls and ceiling. Install high quality windows and add shading where needed. Design out places of excessive heat or cooling loss. Make your home really airtight. And with an airtight home, suddenly ventilation systems become super effective. And that's a way to hide from wildfire smoke when it settles over us for weeks on end. Although in any event, at all times, passive houses offer superior indoor air quality. Here's a passive house. You can see the, the thicker walls up here in the, in the window reveals, but otherwise it's, it's quite conventional in appearance. This particular house was built with mostly biogenic materials, meaning wood and cellulose, in order to become a carbon sink. 
It's helping suck that sucking CO2 out of the air. Although it's gonna be a big job to get at all our housing. Millions of existing homes need retrofitting over the next 20 to 30 years. So a readily scalable procedure is absolutely needed in order to reach everyone. So I'm just gonna show a couple of slides to give you a flavor of what can be done. One possible method has been developed in the Netherlands and it's called energy sprong, energy jump in, in, in Dutch. It's a scalable, financially viable, deep energy retrofit program using passive house methods. The idea is to aggregate demand within a single agency. So retrofit financing is kept affordable and the project pipeline is kept full. In the Netherlands, Energy, energy Sprong started simple by first tackling social housing tracks like you see here. Their procedure has matured to the point that this kind of refurbishment is done in a week. Rooftop PV modules are included. Voila, an electrified deep energy retrofit. But the number one action that you can take to help with the climate crisis is to vote. Cast your ballot for candidates who understand the urgency of climate action at all levels of government. By now, we hope you've viewed the play. Dr. Keeling was a terrific scientist. Without him, there would be no 60 years plus record of firsthand CO2 data. Science works because it forces us to be honest with ourselves. The scientific method is the only path we have to objective truth and reality on this planet. People need to internalize that precept if we're to successfully navigate our future. So uh, thanks for listening. Any questions? That's the end of my presentation. Uh, the disaster, the just total catastrophe you described, Rob, how far away is that? Which catastrophe? <laughs> well, where all the methane just explodes and, and the situation becomes hopeless. I don't know. Nobody knows. Right. That's, what's, that's what's particularly alarming about all of this is that nobody knows. It's, it's truly an experiment in the making. Like science can't, science can give general predictions, but the way you verify scientific theory is by running an experiment. We are running that experiment now. And once this is over, we will know <laughs> how long it took for those, that catastrophe to develop, but because there will then be data in the bank. But right now, this has never happened before, so we can make generalized predictions, but there is no single um, determination of how that would take. What we need to do is we need to act like, like President Biden has been telling us as soon as possible. We need, to, we need to be making changes immediately, not saying, okay, well, we got, I, I didn't show any graphs going out into the future, predictions about this many years or that many years for the very reason is that that, that will be perhaps lead to some false sense of security, some self-assurance to some. There is, there is no um, margin anymore. We have to just, all of us, decarbonize as quickly as possible. Rob, if you can hear me, uh, it's Mike. Yes, I can, Mike. Uh, the, 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 the kind of hideous suggestion that all of this methane is up trying to burst through. The only answer, as I understood your presentation to that problem, is to lower temperatures so that the um, the crust that is above it doesn't evaporate. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Put a giant air conditioning system up in the Arctic. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Unfortunately, it's the Arctic. It's the northern well, the extreme latitudes, the very far north and very far south that are heating up 
the fastest. You may remember from that video, it was the reddest colors were up there in the, the north. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Um, I, th I think it's just because um, it, it's like an equilibrium of water. Water always seeks its own level. It's the coldest up there. So as the temperature generally warms everywhere, it's mm -hmm. kind of it's kind of it's it, you know it's sliding down into that coldest area first. I see. So Rob, just just to repeat, uh, we have no way of knowing anytime soon how when this might happen. No. Yeah. No. And it's not even. You see, it's not factored into IPC predictions. Oh boy. Well, we have to assume, don't we, that it is happening. I mean, we're talking about a process that is taking place at this point. Yes. And it yes. will accelerate if we don't do anything uh, to mitigate it. Yes. Right. Yes. And as, as I mentioned, half, half of the warming so far is due to methane. Almost half, right? Right. All right. So, so, okay, what can we as individuals do? to slow this down, keep it from happening. We, we have to listen to the scientists yeah. and, and the climate scientists and accept, accept, their, <laughs> accept their knowledge, their expert knowledge and, and their concern and abide by their, their suggestions to, to you know, uh, make a rapid decarbonization, rapidly reduced 100% clean energy as fast as we can. There is no guarantee, but certainly going faster is better than slower. All right. All right. But the suggestion, it seems to me, is that uh, while we as individuals can do the things we talked about, you talked about how we can deal with our homes, we can deal with our diets, we can deal with our uh, general manner of living, but it has to be done, it would seem to me, on a governmental level to, to, to be able to create this sort of massive change that you think is needed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We, we, need, we need policy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, um, I don't know if there are any Republicans in the audience, but we really need, the Democrats need to control Congress. We have to have the House, we have to have the Senate. Uh, the media makes it sound like it's already a done deal and it's hopeless. No, it's not. You know, the election hasn't taken place yet. Um, there are two uh, congressional districts in California where we could, the, th the uh, 25th up around Santa Clarita, that election was won by a Republican by 333 votes. That was, that was two years ago. Uh, and also the 48th, uh, in Costa Mesa, Huntington Beach, Laguna Beach, and so on. Um, the 45th uh, looks pretty good. Uh, but again, I know that's where all you guys are, who's in the 45th. Uh, so, I mean, vote and please get out to vote. Um, it's, you know, for example, uh, a lot of people from LA uh, went up to Santa Clarita to the uh, 25th and uh, elected a Democrat to the House. Uh, it's possible, if you wouldn't mind doing a little traveling, you could, you could go to the 48th and, and uh, knock on doors. That's what they did in Santa Clarita and it made a big difference. That's what I'm planning to do in Santa Clarita as we get closer to the election. But it's, yeah, uh, uh, to make any real difference and uh, President Biden really could have made a difference with his, his climate bill. Yeah, we, we just have to do that. We got to get out the vote. There, um, there are some questions in the chat. I'm not sure is um, is Joanne was that? Did did you want us to answer the questions in the chat? I think you. Can, I think you can. Come, oh no, we, no yeah, we're now, um, we're now. I can you hear me? Yeah, but we have. Um, yeah, there, but we have. There were a couple questions that came through the chat. So for uh, just so for the people here in our audience who may have may not have seen them. One of the questions that came through is um, actually tied to a question that had also previously been submitted. So I'm going to ask a twofold question. Uh, what can you tell us about ca cattle and how methane is being captured or not being captured? And the second question is how much difference would it make if 50% of the population became vegetarian? 
Um, um, is it still there? No, it's okay. Uh, no, I, I don't. I don't eat meat. Uh, Mike doesn't eat meat. What about you, Rob? Are you are you a vegetarian or? Um, I haven't completely become a vegetarian because there's there's a there's a <laughs> there's difficulty in our in our household with my my wife. She's having uh, she she's very much a uh, doesn't want to doesn't want to change her her lifelong diet. So we we eat a minimal amount of meat, but oh, okay. we haven't. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I, I presume the answer is it would make a tremendous difference. If well, so it will. It will make a difference. It's something we have to do, but it's it alone won't be sufficient. Okay. I mean, it's it's and all of the above that we have to do. I mean, we have to become, you know, many more people have to become vegans or vegetarians. We have to stop burning fossil fuels. We have to stop uh, the um, deforesting the planet we have to we have to re reforest the planet if we can because that would be one way to sequester carbon right the trees will will more trees will grow and absorb carbon and um we can yeah, all, all of the above right we have and so there was a question about the cattle also about about um about um capturing the methane from the cattle there is Currently, there's no way to capture methane that's released by cattle. I mean, we can capture methane from landfill, but then all we can do with it is burn it, which then just generates CO2. Uh, there, um, so the best way, uh, you know, the most the most effective way to capture the ca uh, methane released by cattle is not to have so many cows. Right. Yeah. yeah, they're destroying rainforest, the, the Amazon rainforest, to create pasture for cows so they can make more hamburgers and steaks and so on. It's crazy. Can, can I back can up? I and back up. And, I, I don't know if I'll create a, an echo or not, but if I don't, uh, let me say that the, the, the um, targeting of the Republicans, as you've suggested, George, um, while I understand it, um, I think it's important to not vilify people who happen to be Republican, but to understand that the policies or lack of policy in one sense of the Republican Party is really what's at issue here. It has always been, uh, I think it's fair to say, uh, in, in support of big business, profit overall, um, and the and that leads to the power of the people in the billionaire class and the people in the in the quite quite wealthy arenas to um to make policy and those policies become denialist policies denial of, of global warming denial of um what have you so I, I don't have any problem with republicans i have a problem with the way republican policies are damaging our lifestyle and i think people who are long time believers in the concept of the fundamental concepts of the Republican Party really ought to be our allies in this. They should be, yeah, sure. Uh, I know a scientist said to me a while back, he said, uh, it's only be, until the people, uh, the big corporate people, the big money people get the message that they can't do business on a planet that's falling apart, that we're going to see some, you know, then we'll see some change. Um, and some of them have gotten that message. So let's hope so. Yeah. Um, wow. Just, uh, yeah, Joanne. Uh, so uh, another question that has come in is regarding nuclear energy. And so giving, given that renewable sources provide only a small percentage of our energy and that nuclear power is so expensive, what can we do realistically to put uh, off fossil fuels as soon as possible, and what are your thoughts on nuclear energy as an alternative? As an alternative. Well, I, I feel strongly that we need more nuclear energy. Uh, the Chinese are building 1,500 new nuclear plants. Uh, nuclear is back in Europe. The Europeans are building them, and I know I know it's still a controversial subject. 
but um, I don't know. I mean, uh, the media, I, I think, is they're constantly running uh, documentaries about Chernobyl and Fukushima and so on. Um, very few people died, for example, in Fukushima from radiation. There's no proof that anyone died from radiation. The Japanese government uh, just uh, really overreacted to the situation. They required people to move 150 miles away from the zone. Uh, a lot of these people were elderly. A lot of them were in nursing homes, hospitals, and a lot of them died. So, but that's my feeling. I know uh, there are people very, there's a lot of concern about the storage problem, but uh, that's all. I, I feel it's also, nuclear is very expensive, but so is, uh, so is climate change. If we lose the planet, where are we? Um, frankly, it would be a lot cheaper to defeat climate change than it would be than the kind of money we spent defeating Hitler. World War II, the US spent 36% of its GDP on the war. Right? Uh, Biden uh, modestly suggested that we spend $550 billion, which is not a lot of money, but it would have made a big difference. I hope we can still get to spend a lot of that. George, George and I have a little bit of difference uh, here. Uh, I'm, I've long been anti-nuke um, and uh, I, I very fear, much fear the uh, lack of safe um, storage of nuclear waste. However, I, it has come to my understanding that even um, people in the scientific community now believe that nuclear power is a, is a preferable uh, bridge technology until to the point where we get uh, other and more efficient ways to generate energy. Yeah, uh, a lot of climate scientists, about two thirds of scientists are, are in favor of nuclear now. So, yeah. So I, so I kind I, of, I kind of were... sorry. I, I don't, do we have time? Do we have time for another comment on that? I, I, I fit in the middle in there. I think I, I, it's um, my assessment that we should definitely keep the, the nukes we have and we should run them for as long as we can and, and stay with that. Um, we haven't solved the, the storage issue, the waste issue, and we're we're setting ourselves up for a, a, a terrible situation if we if we continue um, with that dilemma. And we're building more nukes, and we still have any, and we're doing it, and we know we haven't even got a complete solution. So we should certainly use the ones we have. Um, and 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 then there's another issue that encompasses new construction. Uh, those power plants, the nukes. Uh, now there's going to be the, the the generation four, and they're they're going to be small modular reactors. But because they're small, you're going to need more of them. A lot of concrete, an awful lot of concrete, goes into building a reactor and a power station. Concrete is a the the cement, the cement that uh, makes concrete is is a very copious producer of CO2. I mean, it's just chemistry. We're taking limestone and then we're boiling off the, the carbonates to make the cement. Uh, and it produces an awful lot of carbon dioxide. So even before the power, it gets the, a single watt of power is produced. There's a giant impulse of, of, of embodied material emissions that come out of construction of these big power plants. Um, and so, that that's that in in conjunction with just the whole uncertainty of, of storage is mean, means that we you know we we could be just setting ourselves up for another big fall uh, somewhere down the road 100 200 years yes i agree it's clean energy we need all that baseline power but there there is there, there is another way that we can achieve this that nobody wants to talk about very few people talking about which is if we have climate change we have to get rid of fossil fuels we have, a, we have an existential problem with nukes still. Where does that leave us? What we have to do is we have to power down. We have to use less energy. Okay. I've, I've shown one way we can get by with a lot less energy in our homes. It just doesn't mean, doesn't mean going back to the, to the Stone Age. 
Um, it just means using energy more wisely, more efficiently, uh, maybe not traveling on airplanes every every couple of weeks. So I saw a question in the chat about about flying. Yes, flying is a, is an is an, a very um, copious emitter of, of greenhouse gases. It's not only CO2, it's, it's the, high, the high level NOxes and SOxes that get produced up, up high that, that also are, are contributing to, to quicker warming. Um, so we would have to, you know, we'd have to use some of the less, less extravagance in some of our, uh, our, our vacations and, and our travel plans. Um, I personally, and this is just my own opinion, I think the liberal version of climate denial that you we have has been so widely publicized in you know in the press about about from the from the right uh, wing, uh, travel is the liberal form of climate denial. Uh, too many people want to just travel with and damn damn the consequences, and I think that that needs to be addressed. Yeah, sorry for the okay. long um, I, Thank you for that. Uh, I wanted to combine a couple of questions and it relates, Rob, to what you were just talking about, climate denial. So we hear the words hoax and denier a lot. Um, how, do we, how do we develop the political and, and popular will to make change? Well, I guess we could have a thousand more presentations like this one, yeah? Uh, really, uh, well, we've all said it, vote, get out the vote, you know, um, without, without, if the Democrats can't hold the House and, and take the Senate, uh, we're going to, you know, nothing's going to happen. As a matter of fact, probably with Trump, everything went backwards. So that, that's, that's, that's one big way. We can all start uh, driving electric cars, which are a lot more affordable now than they were. I think edu education, education, education. Yeah, yeah. Really the issue. People need to better understand and they need to get it from sources that they trust. And that's a problem because of the whole uh, campaign about fake news. Um, but we really have to find a way to educate people in um, as positive and as Im uh, urgently and uh, quickly um, uh, way as possible. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I've got yeah, one. I've got one. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I have the floor. Uh, if we if we talk about it at a personal level, and 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 we talk about food, um, a question came up: If we're going to grill, that's assuming we're going to grill. Uh, sh is charcoal liquid liquid propane or natural gas? Uh, which, which of those is the best and which is which of those is the worst? Well, well natural I gas, um, I know it's billed as, as a bridge fuel, but uh, it's, it's, it's really very carbon intensive. And Rob, you were talking about if we had electric houses, we wouldn't need natural gas. Uh, well, we wouldn't be using natural gas. We could, we could do all of do what we need, elect, we, we electrify the house. I mean, that's that's an ongoing it, it, uh, uh, campaign right now in California. So th that will happen, but it will be more expensive. So we have to also make the houses more efficient so that we don't use, so the electric bill, the bottom line electric bill isn't as high because we won't be using so much electricity. Have, right? The, Does that speak to the question? Um, no, I don't think it does. Um, my, my answer would be none of the above. <clears throat> this, this is an example of, I mean, I'm, I mean, <laughs> it's just my, it's my, my opinion, take it or leave it, but it's my opinion. That's one of the changes we're going to have to, uh, make in our lifestyle. Uh, you can do an electric girl, maybe do it on, just do it with electric heat. But, uh, any of those fuels you mentioned are all are fossil fuels. They all release carbon dioxide. I mean, every action matters now. Everything we do matters. Right. Yeah. So I would say none of the above. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of favor uh, an all of the above uh, solution. I mean, there's, there's not gonna be any one solution that's gonna make uh, so much difference, but what, whatever you can do, any, any combination, whatever you can do. Does that sound about right? 
Rob, Rob. But I, I, we, were I, just, I, we were talking about the uh, gr grilling fuels, what to use for grilling. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, another question that came up, I think, was partially answered, but I'd like to return to it. Uh, are there promising technologies for for sequestering or, or capturing carbon? Anything that that we can be hopeful for? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, carbon capture and storage. Michael Mann just came out with a new book. He talks about it as really a, almost like a scam that the fossil fuels industry is uh, trying out. It's, it's giving people false hope. It doesn't really remove much carbon and it just keeps the fossil fuel thing going. So that's, that's not an answer. Um, I've talked to scientists who are working on ways of directly removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, it's kind of a bit of magical thinking right now because the technology is at, a, is at a very early stage. We're talking about the Wright brothers airplane, basically. Uh, so is that likely to make a difference anytime soon? Sooner or later, we, we've got to do it. We, we can't leave all that CO2 up there. As long as it's up there, we're gonna have problems. But um, that's all. Uh, so anyone else have anything to offer on that? Okay. Okay, other than voting, how can we hold corporations responsible for climate change? Boycott? Huh? Boycott? Yeah, boycotts, sure. Uh, environmentalists have joined the boards of directors of various corporations and, you know, they, they make life difficult. Um, they get a hearing that way. Divestment? Divestment, yes. It certainly works in the case of South Africa, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, I would add, by, I would the, add, by the way, uh, more than a thousand colleges and universities have uh, divested from fossil fuels. So that's, 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 uh, that's encouraging. And so therefore encouraging that sort of behavior on the parts of other right. institutions would be a good idea. So if you're an alumnus or an alumna <clears throat> at a college or university, you might yeah. see if they're one of those thousand. Make some noise about it. Maybe I should. I have to check it out. Yeah. Uh, you talked about some of the extreme temperatures uh, that we're facing on an annual, almost annual basis. Are climate models being updated to include these extreme temperatures? And are we on track to exceed three Celsius within the next couple of years? Should, should I take that one? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yes, the climate models are being updated all the time. Um, the, the next IPCC uh, assessment report, which will, the entirety of it will be coming out in the next couple of years. We had a prelude to that in August when, when the working group one came up with a, with a summary. Um, and, and so th that report is where we, uh, got the, the statement from the, the UN Secretary General about a code red. I mean, we're in a code red situation because the, their models are, are starting to incorporate methane now and, and some rudimentary model of, of the leaking, of the, of the melting permafrost. You see, but these are models. They're just, and they're very simple because no one really under, understands how, how, do you, how do you do that? I mean, you cannot build a computer model and just put guesswork into it. So you have to have some understanding and there's very little understanding of those models. So that's why that's, that's a, very diff, a, a very dangerous situation for us. I mean, um, uh, but, but they're, they're, they are getting better. Um, they are improving, I should say. As far as the three degrees Celsius goes, all, all of these predictions that we've been hearing about three, four, five degrees, none of that to date incorporates methane, none of it. 
It's all just on CO2 release. So we don't, we really don't know. And, and the, the predictions we do have about staying below 2.2 or 1.5, all of that is still based upon promissory notes. We actually are on a trajectory for a five degree Celsius rise. If you actually just look at where we have come to date, I mean, there are a lot of promises to say, oh yeah, yeah, we're gonna do this and that. So far, most of those haven't been followed. That's wild. I didn't know that. So in yeah. other words, uh, Michael Mann, um, Mark Linus, and so on, all their projections don't include methane? Um, well, I don't know about every single author, uh, George, yeah. but, but, but the general, the general right. IPC yeah. predictions that we've heard of, you know, you know, these degrees Celsius increase, okay. they haven't taken into account methane. Wow. Okay. That's very, you, that's very scary. But, but now, but but now the future, the next reports will have a rudimentary inclusion of that. Just like they weren't like including they were inclu the melting ice caps were not, sea level rise was not incorporated. Uh, the melting ice caps did not, were not included in, I mean, Greenland, Antarctica, up until the, the, this latest set that's coming out did not, sea level rise did not include the, the melting of those caps because they couldn't model them. Thank you. Uh, could you perhaps describe what we would be looking at, say, in 20 or 30 years? What would our world look like if we were to hit that two or three degrees Celsius? Well, two degrees is very, is very serious. Um, we'd lo probably lose the um, Amazon rainforest. Uh, temperatures would be much higher. People would have a hard time working outdoors. It would cut down on um, agricultural production. Um, three degrees is very scary. I mean, there are 500 million small farmers in Africa. That's how they feed their families by whatever food they can, they can grow. They won't be able to grow food anymore. Uh, there are hundreds of millions of people in South Asia who are going to suffer the same fate. So you're going to have an impossible number of climate refugees. And already, uh, we've seen a lot of political destabilization in Europe. Uh, when Angela Merkel accepted uh, quite a few uh, Syrian refugees, suddenly Germany had a right wing that was growing. And we've seen that in other countries. So you're looking at a, at a, at a climate a planet in chaos, really. Uh, three degrees, we absolutely cannot go there. Any other questions for the panel today, either from the sanctuary here or online? I think I just had one last question on my list, and that was how many California legislators have actually confirmed that they believe in climate change? I don't know. It's a good question. We got to find that out. Yeah. Yeah. May, may I make a difference since you're coming to the last question? May I just make a comment, um, uh, please? Uh, uh, and that is, and it sounds kind of self serving. But I want, to, I want to point to George and his having uh, understood this problem early on and having uh, used his talent to write a play that anybody could do, any actor could do. I, I've just been fortunate enough to be the one who's done it. But this play then has generated um, more interest and more understanding, I think, in this issue than many other forms of attempts to, um, uh, to, to elevate people's understanding of the dangers of, that we're looking at. Um, and I think, I think these kinds of discussions um, could be happening. Um, unfortunately, the play hasn't been able to be done because of the pandemic and gathering people in an audience hasn't been um, available to us. But um, I guess you've gotten the video and some of you at least have seen it. And I think that's great. But I think, I think we've got to really promote 
not just Dr. Keeling's curve, but promote anything that is um, uh, being done today in a positive way to alert people to the impending disaster that my children, as well as my grandchildren, are going to be facing in the not too far distant future. Um, actually, they're already seeing it now, but we remark on it as, oh my God, what an unusual thing for us in Southern California to have a week long string of 80 plus degree days in February. Um, we, uh, th th there are things happening now that we need to we need to be awakened to and uh, i want to salute george and rob and the other people who are doing the work that is uh, that is so important in this area and just in terms of helping people to get an understanding um, we live in a, we live in an era where there is a great deal of cynicism and distrust of government distrust of the media distrust of your neighbor um, much of it um, fertilized by the last administration. Um, but the fact is, it can be overcome by good information. And I just want to urge everybody to uh, do what they can to see to it that these kinds of discussions are promoted around um, as best you can. Thank you, Mike. And thank you for offering your, your services to Dr. Keeling Skirr. Um, if I had just proceeded with it without you, I, I knew I needed an, a known actor, a name actor, and so on. And one day I interrupted Mike and asked him how he felt about climate change. And he said, oh, it's terrible. You know, that started it. So there we go. And thank you, everybody here. And uh, Joanne and uh, Carol and so on. And Dave, um, we should do more of this. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I want to thank everyone for their participation today and a huge thank you uh, for our panel, for Mike Farrell, Rob Haw, and George Shaw for participating with us today and providing us this really important information. We. We, we really do appreciate your taking your time, your precious time to be with us this Sunday. And um, hopefully we can work to continue to minimize the effects of global warming through our small efforts at home and, and by voting. So with that, thank you again. And it's George Shea. <laughs> All right.